the white space uh, is 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 broad right now. There's a lot of white space right in this space. The cognitive disorders are, uh, as we ascertained, a giant unmet medical need. And even where we've seen approvals, uh, we've seen lackluster results. Lackluster embrace. Uh, like I said, it's been sort of a roller coaster ride in recent years. Um, so I'm curious about how sort of that that roller coaster ride affects day to day at DDF. How is that? You know, recent approvals, failures, public and patient perceptions. How how, how do those inform what DDF is doing and where it goes next? So, I th I think that there. that these mag sort of macro events are critical when you're looking at the medium to long-term trajectory of the field. So when DDF was first created in 2015, you know, there hadn't ever been a disease modifying drug approved for Alzheimer's disease. Even the symptomatic drugs that were in use were really for all intents and purposes, decades old. You know, we look. We did a uh, you know an internal analysis and found that if you're only looking at oncology drugs since the year 2000, there were well over 500 new oncology drugs approved by the FDA. At the same time, there had only ever been nine Alzheimer's drugs approved, mm -hmm. and the first two disease modifying drugs were just approved in the last several years. So, you had this landscape where there was um, pessimism, perhaps, by many about the ability to successfully develop drugs for Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. And then you have these transformational events like the first approval of anti-amyloid drugs and, and Alzheimer's disease modifying drugs. Or you you ask questions about modalities, the first approval of antisense oligonucleotide drugs in the CNS, right, for SMA. Or the first gene therapies for for CNS diseases, which give either the pharmaceutical companies or the investors or other players in the ecosystem confidence that we understand these diseases well enough to deliver drugs. We understand clinical development well enough to develop drugs and that the regulatory agencies have established pathways to get these drugs approved. It's sometimes more lenient pathways than we're expected, as was in the case with the anti amyloid drugs or some of the ALS approvals. So we certainly can react to that. At the same time, you know, ventures a long life cycle business, you know, biotechnology companies are long life cycle businesses. You know, it takes many years to develop a drug. So we need to balance these individual events, which might be Catalytic for investment interest, the ability to raise follow-on financing, public market interests, you know, the ability to take a company public or not, you know, and access that capital. We need to balance these macro factors with these longer term considerations, like, you know, what are the patient needs? What other drugs are in the pipeline, even if they're not in late stage clinical trials or approved. Uh, so we can ensure that we're creating a longitudinal plan for each of these companies, each of these investments that we believe could be individually successful. Sure. And we think there's a lot of room again, because of the white space we talked about for many of these, uh, for many companies to be successful. And, and from an impact perspective, we wish every company is going to be successful, not just the ones that we are, we're investing in as well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you contrasted this CNS disorder space with, with oncology and you referenced, you know, that's the slew of approvals in oncology versus the, the very few in CNS disorders. And it, it occurs to me, uh, that where, where there have been 500 approvals, it's not hard to extrapolate from that data, some regulatory strategy because those regulatory pathways, you know, they're, okay, they're, they're you could assume that there, there are some well-established trends, right? Um, you mentioned that there's been progress in the regulatory pathway aspect of, of, of CNS disorder. Uh, did, yeah, I guess, uh, color that in a little bit, like where, where do you, yeah, where do where do you see that, that sort of pathway revealing itself? Um, and how, 
how might that play into not just EDF strategy, but but any CMS disorder company's regulatory strategy? Yeah, so I'll take those two questions separately. So, uh, you know, I, I think the generic assumption, the generic approval pathway at the FDA had always been two phase three, two successful phase three studies, right? You had to twice prove in a clinical outcome focused study that you could have a meaningful benefit with the appropriate safety profile. Mm -hmm. And where we, we have specific examples in dementias where drugs have gotten approved with very different data packages than, than that historical norm, right? Starting, uh, or I can start the example certainly with, with aducanumab, which was the first anti-amyloid drug that was approved. That was really one successful phase three. And then, you know, a, a, a second pivotal study that was um, more questionable, right? Both in terms of how it was concluded and, and what the resulting data package was. Or going to the Amlex drug that was recently withdrawn, right? Where it was an accelerated approval based on a single study. And so these examples were showing that at least in the United States, the FDA was recognizing the unmet medical need, the burden on patients, and was willing to consider alternative beta packages, right? When they were balancing the patient benefit and the potential risks. And I think that has been very encouraging for the field um, because the time and cost to get a drug to the market that works is going to be substantially less than it would have been if you were assuming the original right re regulatory framework. Now, the FDA is continually updating their guidances. You know, we can't be sure exactly what the path is going to be in the future. And it's certainly going to be drug dependent, mechanism dependent, disease dependent. Um, but this was just, these were individually very encouraging events, I think, for companies and investors in the space. Yeah. And we hope that many of our companies will get to take advantage of accelerated pathways, either in the US or abroad, to get drugs to patients quicker and, and, and accelerate that impact. Very good. What, what else, uh, sort of informs or influences DDF strategy that our listeners who might be interested in, you know, we, we've got plenty of folks who are coming out of academia with great ideas. What, what should they know about what influences DDF's strategy? Yeah. I mean, again, I think we we're trying to find the best the best opportunities to impact disease. And so I think if you're talking about academic scientists who are transitioning, um, you know, certainly I think we're looking, f I personally always ask the question, you know, why now? And, and that sometimes translates to the academics as to, you know, what's the fundamental new data point, understanding insight, right? That suggests that this new drug target or this new approach is going to be the the approach to solve this problem that's been facing us for so long. Uh, and to start, you know, a new company or to, to make an investment in something at a very early stage, you know, I've used that word transformational so much, I'm probably wearing it out, but, but yeah. um, it, it, you, the, the approach fundamentally needs to be differentiated in some way from what came before it. Right. So we have a company um, called Curalis, which is focused on ALS. It's developing uh, a small molecule, but also antisensitive oligonucleotides, and, and fundamentally is focused on loss of function of TDB43. And they were able to develop some fundamental insights around ALS biology by using human induced pluripotent stem cells. And the insight came from the unsurprising realization that the biology was fundamentally different in human cells than in rodent cells, right? Or in all these preclinical models that had been used historically to study ALS. And we could point at, at experiments and data and say, this is the reason why this drug target was missed and, and why we should believe in it now uh, and, and advance a new drug. 
And so I think having stories like that, um, which relates these new approaches to human biology uh, and relates new approaches to fundamental new insights, right, is, is really helpful in, in um, establishing a case for, for why now. Sometimes it's not biology. Sometimes it's a new tool, right? You know, CRISPR gene editing is invented, and all of a sudden there's biology that couldn't have been accessed in a translational way before that you could now access. Or again, maybe we go back to the example I used previously. First, antisense oligonucleotides approved, and now there's there's new drug targets that you can get at um, in a lower risk way that you couldn't have before. So the, the insight is not always, or the, or the reason the time is now is not always, uh, you know, some new biology. But uh, we really need to understand what's what's creating this this novelty and this opportunity to to make a new investor yeah uh w- look looking ahead at the landscape looking at what's in front of uh ddf not just ddf but the the entire cns disorder space what what are you maybe most excited about that, that you can share publicly <laughs> well you know that's a good question i think we have many companies in our portfolio that we're excited about, and I think we can talk about certain themes, right? Um, certainly, I think that there is a lot of new biology that we're understanding with neurodegenerative diseases that's enabling us to go after new targets. Um, and they might fit under some broader classifications that people have talked about in the past, like neuroinflammation. But the individual approaches are distinct from um, some of the more canonical targets that have been in the in the in the drug development landscape for for decades. And so we have a company, for example, called Arini Biosciences that is entering the clinic with a new antibody to block neuroinflammation. But they're not targeting a cell surface protein or a cytokine, what they're targeting is a cryptic epitope of fibrin that is driving inflammation. So when there's blood-brain barrier disruption um, in these neurodegenerative diseases, leaky blood vessels, fibrin escapes from the blood vessels, deposits an extracellular matrix, and a very specific epitope is then displayed, which drives inflammation because the body's recognizing that there's some pathology. And so by blocking that with an antibody, we can have therapeutic effects in multiple disease models and neuroinflammation as well as in um, eye disease. So it's a new way to get at a mechanism that we know is important, um, but this is an approach that hasn't been tried before. Uh, We have another company called Nitrase Therapeutics that discovered an entirely new class of enzymes. So they discovered a class of enzymes that they call nitrases which are analogous to kinases, but instead of attaching a phosphate group to proteins, they site specifically attach a nitrate group. This is an entire white space area of biology that had never been studied before. This modification had been discovered in the past, but it was thought to be just driven by oxidative stress at random. So nitrates now is a development candidate, and it's advancing into the clinic to treat Parkinson's disease. But there's a potential for an entire pipeline behind it, not just in neurodegenerative disease, but in other diseases as the biology behind these nitrate enzymes is is further understood. So I think there's a lot of transformational opportunities. I mean, I could spend another hour just going through our entire portfolio because we're excited about each opportunity. But um, I think, and I think going beyond that, just to reflect on something that was mentioned in your ADDF podcast, I think think we're also interested in continuing to look at the drivers of disease uh, and how they relate to age. So certainly the ho- largest non-genetic risk factor, right? Uh, or, or the largest risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease, for example, is age. Yeah. So, you know, we, we need to understand various mechanisms, whether it be mitochondrial biology and metabolism or, or inflammation or other uh, age-related mechanisms that we can continue to, to target because they're not just usually relevant for one disease, they're relevant for many diseases. That increases mm-hmm. the opportunity for impact as well. Yeah, very good. Well, you know, you 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 mentioned that you could talk for another hour, and uh, it, it occurred to me a few minutes ago uh, that I was going to ask you for access to some of the the founders of your portfolio companies to be guests on the business of biotech. We can continue the conversation that way, perhaps. Of uh, course. Yeah, yeah. We'll 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 talk about that offline. Maybe come up with a roster of of DDF portfolio companies that might be interested in coming on the show. And sharing their stories. Uh, 
But I, I really appreciate the time you spent with us now. And uh, if you need another hour, we'll do a part two. How about that? Yeah. Well, yeah. like, if your audience is interested, I'm always happy to share more about what we're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, because again, I think I met me need is unparalleled. That creates the opportunity for impact and returns. Uh, and we certainly believe that a, a venture model is the right model to accomplish both. So um, maybe the part two is in a few years, we'll talk about a few more drug approvals. That would be very exciting. Yeah.